Hello and welcome to The Y Word, the podcast that gets under the skin of entrepreneurs, business people, and basically anyone who makes things happen, to ask why they do what they do. My name is Ian Hawkins, and in this episode, you will hear... Humans survive because we care about each other, because we're connected to each other, because we're so aware of each other. The challenge with something like the COVID virus, the SARS-2, is that we even have diminish the, if you will, socially acceptable ways the touch occurs for adults. Handshakes, hugs, pats on the back, high fives. These kinds of things now represent public health danger. Sometimes when someone says to me, hey, I've got a lot of great content, I can't figure out how to put it in a presentation that's gripping, I always say, you know, how would you do it as a play? How would you tell that story if it was in the form of an anecdote? Ravi Rao wanted to be an actor, but quickly found himself in the wrong sort of theatre when he moved into neuroscience. His next sideways move was into management consultancy with McKinsey. And if that sounds like an odd career, the title of his book, Emotional Business, sums it all up nicely. So, Ravi, welcome to The Y Word. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm delighted to have you because I'm psychology and brains are my thing. And I'd love to know, from working with sick brains to McKinsey, was that, a, was that a big leap or a natural progression? I think my skill set has always been in trying to figure out how people work. When I realized clinical care was not the right place for me, it actually was quite interesting. The, the transition to McKinsey was not hard because the basic concept of let's get data, let's get information, and let's figure out how all the pieces fit together and why it is or isn't working it was quite similar. I enjoyed both the kind of clinical way of thinking and the kind of more analytical data-driven way of thinking. Both of them complemented each other in the way I began to see how people work together. It's interesting you talk about data because surely emotional business, which is where you have made your mark, is that data? It's more how you feel, isn't it? How do you, how do you pin down a data onto a spreadsheet or a number? It's true that emotion historically has been described more so in poetic terms and in things that are very ethereal and hard to get specific definitions on. People say, oh, it's kind of squishy, touchy-feely, and can inherently make a lot of people uncomfortable to hear about. The way I thought about it comes back to that scientific training I had during the 1990s in my schooling, that emotion doesn't happen in the heart. It's not a mysterious, vague, effect of spirits, we know now that emotion happens in very specific areas of the brain and we continue to learn more about that. One of our biggest clues is is that when people have a brain injury or a stroke or a brain tumor, their emotions change, their behaviors change, their interactions with the world changes. So for me, emotion has always been what's happening in the brain to allow people to feel anger, what's happening in the brain to allow people to feel depression, what's happening in the brain that allows people to be great leaders and great communicators versus struggling with it. I will definitely come back to that, Ravi, with no problem. But I can feel in my senses that there may be people switching off and saying, but my business is all about the bottom line. You know, your emotional approach to business, how does that impact down where it's profit and loss and on on the balance sheet? I think any business leader if you ask a few basic questions, gets this concept immediately. Have you lost business because your internal group of people did not communicate well? Was the handoff of information bad? Did you lose great talent because they said, I don't need to work in an environment like this. I'll go elsewhere where it's better. Over and over again, whether it's on the talent side, on the process side, even on the technology side, you may invest in a beautiful enterprise software. And if no one's using it, and if no one's compliant with it, because they haven't bought into the idea, and you haven't engaged them in its benefits to them, and allowed them to feel the emotional connection to why we work together on this and why we're all going to follow the same path, business fails. There is a uh, African proverb that I believe in, which is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
And the basis of going together anywhere is that you have to have people in your business to achieve the bottom line who fundamentally want the same things, who fundamentally want to be involved towards the same goal, the same objectives. Lots of companies I observe have the challenge of they set up these beautiful key performance indicators for each unit, these KPIs. But very often, what maximizes the KPIs in unit A is exactly the opposite of what will maximize the KPIs in unit B. So they are essentially working as hard as they can, but going in opposite directions because they each have their own KPIs. It's this lack of uh, overall systemic awareness and an overall systemic understanding of how people need to work together that are the problems that I try to address. It does make sense to bring emotion into inside businesses because if you think about the customers, they always act emotionally anyway. Uh, shout back to episode four where we had BJ Cunningham and he said it's really important that people have, a, have, have an opinion about your product or service before they go and buy it or put their hand in their pocket. Does, does anybody ever make a decision on pure, cold, rational facts? I think people think they do, and they may <laughs> convince themselves, oh, I'm not emotional, I'm purely uh, logical, and may even try to emulate or adopt the mindset of the fictional character, Vulcan, Mr. Spock from Star Trek, who's all logic and no emotion. That's actually not how humans work. In fact, one thing we know back to the neuroscience part of it is there is so much of the brain that is devoted to emotion, awareness of others. In many cases, the same places where we take in sensory information in auditory cortex, in the touch areas, even in the smell areas, these are co-located with the areas of emotion. So it's very hard to say, I want to take emotion out of the business environment. If you want to do that, you're going to have to take the humans out of the business environment entirely. So going back to, to, to brain injuries, because I find these really interesting. It's really easy to spot when, a, when somebody with a brain injury can't move a hand or can't speak again. But what about when they lose an emotion? Does that happen? And, and how can you spot it? There are a couple of ways that brain injuries and or brain tumors or strokes can impair emotional processing and emotional functionality. One way is in the ways that you might call more dramatic. Suddenly they are flat. They lose the ability to smile or they may look as if they are almost like statues. That happens in particular with stroke, but it can happen in a lot of other neurological conditions as well. But on a more subtle level, you also see things like volatility. Many family members of patients who've had a traumatic brain injury, whether it's in war or after a car crash, will notice a much higher degree of volatility. The person seems nice and calm, and then suddenly one small thing throws them into a huge rage. Those kinds of situations can come up in such a way that the emotional regulation uh, is affected. One thing that we know about the regulation is there is kind of the ordinary day-to-day -day emotional reactions to things, laughter at a joke, tears at something sad. But then there's this other thing about self-regulation and regulation, regulation of others in terms of calmness, in terms of peace, in terms of how, if you will, peaceful or placid is the situation. And those are all brain functions. We can train our brains to be more calm. There are even all these different apps out there about training the mind and training the brain uh, to absorb more of a calm demeanor, to have more of that Buddhist-like meditative state. And that's partly to train those areas of the brain to have this. After injury, after stroke, after trauma, after a tumor, these areas, not only for memory and cognition and so on, can be affected, but so can the areas responsible for emotional processing and creating emotional reaction behavior. I feel like I've definitely been in work environments which have been neurotic, so that <laughs> even the most well-adjusted people do find themselves having to really work at not losing their temper. Uh, there's, there's something in the room. There's, there's something that stops people behaving as they should. Ian, this is such an important point that you raise. Emotion, even though we tend to think of it as an individual issue, an individual human experience, 
It is. You know, your internal emotional state is your experience. Mine may be different even in the same situation. Another factor is that humans feel emotions together. There is a lot of brain space devoted to understanding what other people are feeling. And interestingly, it triggers all kinds of emotions in others. We think of this in terms of in the psychology field, they'll call this things like social contagion, emotional contagion, or they'll talk about it as group dynamics, how one person's emotions and behavior impact another. I like to say that the phrase from the philosopher Descartes, where he said, I think, therefore I am, was only partially right. I tend to think of it as we feel, therefore we are. Humans survive because we care about each other, because we're connected to each other, because we're so aware of each other. And of course, naturally, there are going to be people who say, I want to just shut everybody else. I just want to sit and do my task and get my paycheck and be done. But the reality of things is that for most brains, there is this natural tendency to be connected to others, which is good in the sense that it promotes human survival. But it's bad that it, if there are negative emotions in the group, they spread quickly. And just the examples you said, whether it's paranoia, whether it's a, you've got to keep your guard up around here because everybody's going to backstab you. These kinds of things undermine the quality of human interactions. And ultimately, they can undermine the business. There was something that you wrote about how babies immediately experience the world through touch. And so you did a whole thing about how important a handshake was. How are we supposed to cope now that we can't do that handshake? The truth is, is, as you know, is that we start to see these evidences of how people connect to each other, the emotional elements of this, and how humans form connection in how brand new human brains work. That is how do babies process the world. I think it's important to note that human babies are born very different than other species. Other species are far more independent from their first days. And so we become very dependent on each other for care, for survival. And there are a lot of baby instincts, neurological instincts, motor reflexes. These kinds of things are all related to how babies are connected to the world in which they are entirely vulnerable. And one of those things that we know from babies is an immediate soothing type cycle or circuit that's wired within the baby's infant brain is to be calmed by touch. These are very, very primitive brain signals to say, you're safe, you're calm, you can relax and achieve a peaceful state. And over time, cultures have evolved to create rules about when touch is appropriate, when it's not. And clearly, you should not go around touching everybody, anybody, and everyone anyway. Uh, there are social rules against it, even criminal laws against it. The challenge with something like the COVID virus, uh, SARS-2, is that we even have diminished the, if you will, socially acceptable ways the touch occurs for adults. Handshakes, hugs, pats on the back, high fives. These kinds of things now represent public health danger. So we remove it. What I have suggested to individuals and groups over the last few months is that you still have to find ways to feel connected to others with the removal of touch. So that means even though it may feel unbusinesslike, you have to find alternate mechanisms that allow people to feel connected to each other. So as an example, you have to have moments where people can share humor. People are fundamentally losing connection to each other, perhaps even losing trust in each other, feeling frustration and irritation boil up. How can a leader inject humor into situations to help feel that the group is connected, keep the group connected? Other things that allow the group to be connected are things like common goals in things outside of work. What would people like to see in terms of changes in the world, changes in their society. Even just basic storytelling is another way to connect people. Another is to share personal information. I think every person who's been on Zoom has had the random uh, four-year-old run into the screenshot and say, Daddy, can you help me with, you know, 
these kinds of things where we once would have said, oh my gosh, how professionally inappropriate to have a child in the Zoom meeting. Now I think people have grown to understand that's just part of existence when we're so socially distant. These kinds of things, these humor, human sides of who people are, social connection, even if you will, philosophical connection about broader things like life and survival, these types of things connect people in the absence, to go back to your original question of touch, there are still other ways that people can feel connected. Over the last couple of months, it feels like there has been a bit of a reckoning. We've understood that we are a little bit more vulnerable to what happens out in the world than we realised. And so this talk of how babies interact with the world and how the sense of touch is really important to us as as grown human beings, I, I find this really important as we move forwards and lockdown ends and we start meeting each other professionally and socially again. I wonder how long it will take for all these things to come back. We've broken the habit of shaking hands because we bump elbows. How long will it take to get that back? And how long will it take for us to feel normal? I was really keen to have Ravi on the program because he's such a good communicator. And that goes back to the very first time that we ran into each other at a conference. As a speaker, it's not what you say, it's what the audience hears. And essentially, it's what the audience takes away with them. So I wanted to have a little delve into his background as a communicator and why it is that he feels that it's such a core part of what he does. Ravi, I first met you as a whole group of people were leaving a speech you had been giving or a workshop you've been giving. And they were energized, happy, smiling, laughing, all the things that a workshop presenter wants to leave uh, an audience with. And by the time I got to the front of the crowd and talked to you, I thought, I wish I'd been here an hour ago when you started. <laughs> You're a fabulous communicator. What's, what's the secret? People find themselves most comfortable in different social settings. Some people are exceptional in small groups of 10 or less. Some people are great in one-on-one. Uh, Some people are great in front of a thousand or in front of 20,000. And, you know, I personally like the workshop size group. I like taking a group of a few dozen or maybe a hundred people through a journey together where they're actually interacting with each other. And I have found a lot of that comes from my, uh, as you started my introduction, a lot of that comes from my teenage years and early 20s years when I was still contemplating a career in the theater or in front of the camera uh, as an actor. And those experiences where you're in front of people and you have to keep them wanting to listen, whether that's the way you speak, that's the way you emote, it's the way you move even with your gestures and, and stance and posture that keep eyes on you as a performer on the stage so you can tell the story you need to tell. Uh, I find a lot of benefit. In fact, Sometimes when someone says to me, hey, I've got a lot of great content, I can't figure out how to put it in a presentation that's gripping, I always say, you know, how would you do it as a play? How would you do it as a character-driven story? How would you tell that story if it was in the form of an anecdote? And people are like, well, it's not really an anecdote, it's data and it's slides and so on. And I say, but how would you make it in such a way that you could tell it as a story? And when you do that and you start to draw on things that we know from the theater, the way you speak, the pace of your speech, how much you inflect your voice up and down, these kinds of things allow your audience, whether that's an audience of one or an audience of 1,000, to in, engage with you and even to some degree emotionally connect with you in front of the room. And when that happens, people are impacted. That's the one thing that I would say that. I've really been impressed with doing this kind of work on emotions now for 15 years is that knowledge is very useful. Mindset is very important. These things are you know, critical. So we have trainings and we have campaigns and communications in order to help shift mindset. But fundamentally, when you reach people at their own individual level of emotional experience, their own level of 
what are they doing and why does it have meaning and purpose for them and why does it bring a sense of gratification a sense of connection to others a sense of inclusion a sense of their imagination being stretched when those things happen then people really are committed to that cause or to that business the um famous writer essayist Maya Angelou's quote is, people will forget what you say, people will forget what you do. People never forget how you make them feel. As I think about performers, and I certainly think of you as a really great performer, a really great communicator. And one of the things that people don't get about good communication is that it's not about the person on the stage. It's always about the audience and a complicity between the performer and the audience. And as a performer, you have to give them what they need. Do you, do you feel that contract between you and the audience? Oh, everything is about the audience. In fact, when people say to me, will you come speak on the subject of emotion? I say, oh, happy to. But I immediately say, and who's going to be in the room? One of the frameworks I believe in strongly is that there are seven different ways we communicate the same idea, uh, if you want to call them languages. And these seven languages, people can shift between. You should be able to convey your business idea, your product, your marketing, your internal change program as a business leader, whatever it is, you should be able to do this in all seven languages. And those languages are numbers, logic, inspiration, stories, promises, humor, and empathy. You should be able to say your same message in all seven languages. In fact, I tell people, practice saying your same message in all seven languages. So depending on who you're communicating with, you can shift to that language. So, so tell me what it was that made you start off wanting to be an actor and then make this quite a, quite a dramatic turn into, into neuroscience. Part of that is unpredictable and it just was the case that my journey was my journey. Part of it is explainable, I think. From an early age, I knew I wanted to do something that was involved in storytelling. It's what most captured my own imagination, got me most excited in early years of schooling, even at the age of six or eight or 10. I would listen during math class. I'd listen during science. I'd listen during how to do English structured writing in elementary school in Chicago. But the thing that I was passionate about, the thing that got me uh, excited to go to school was, oh, right now we're in the midst of getting ready for the play. We're going to do this Rodgers and Hammerstein musical in four weeks, and we're getting ready, and we're you know, going through the dance maneuvers and everything. And I, that were, those were some of the most important formative emotional experiences for me. That being said, I was a child in Chicago in the 1970s and 1980s where even though Chicago is diverse, even though Chicago has a long history of amazing theater and uh, amazing contributions to the film industry and music industry, there was even then a sense that, okay, a relatively darker skinned person uh, with a funny name like Ravi Rao, you know, how many parts can you legitimately play on the stage? You can't do Shakespeare, you can't do Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals, because everybody's going to look and say, oh, why is there a brown person on screen? I also had come from an environment where there were multiple physicians in my family. So uncles, aunts, parents, many, many of the family were in some way or the other involved in the medical field. So there was a natural exposure just sitting around family conversations at holidays where people would bring up some new medical procedure or some new pharmaceutical product on the market. And I would be kind of exposed to that. When I started to think about what was going to be the path for my life, I wasn't sure that medicine was right for me either. But then I actually took a class in med school on neuroscience, a required class. And I found it really interesting because it did sort of span both this very scientific, very traditional type of information with implications for how humans interact, with implications for how humans communicate, and to see that those things were altered by changes in the way the brain worked. That was what, for me, clicked everything together. And then suddenly I could see how my 
emotional awareness of how humans interact that had come really from studying theater fit together with the scientific understanding. And I wasn't sure what path to take with that. Clinical medicine didn't exactly work out for me. But then when I started to say, well, what other options are there? Again, through sort of fortuitous circumstances, I was very uh, gratified, very, feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to join McKinsey. And I spent five years at McKinsey, learned a lot about the nature of business, the nature of organizations. And then after leaving McKinsey again, reached a crossroads. I was 35 at the time, trying to figure out what comes next? What do I do with this? It turned out that a client that I had been talking to said something along the lines of, oh, I wish we used our heart more around here. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, you know, I mean, like, I wish we weren't only analytical. I wish we also kind of understood how people work and kind of created a culture that would support business performance. And I sort of giggled at that. He goes, why do you think that? I'm not trying to be funny. Why'd you laugh? And I said, I, no, I think it's a beautiful aspiration. I just think it's funny you think that happens in the heart. That happens in the temporal lobe. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? And so I gave him the kind of brief explanation of emotion as a neuroscience uh, phenomenon. And he said, I think you should do a talk on that. And the next thing I knew, 15 years, I've been working with organizations to help them change emotion. Well, there you are. You see, you've gone from wanting to be on stage doing somebody else's lines, and now suddenly you're on stage doing your own lines. Or Indeed. the script is the script is written by science, I suppose. Indeed. But, Indeed. but Ravi, the joke is on you. Colorblind casting is now a thing. I would see Amadeus, and the guy playing Salieri was black. So, you know, you, <laughs> you, you, you throw it all away for, <laughs> for this. <laughs> the, the last question I always ask people, is this, you're allowed, to, it's the dinner party game, you're allowed to have anybody you like for um, a business lunch. It has to be businessy, it has to be lunch. Uh, but you can have anybody alive, dead, fictional, or not. So who would you sit down, you have to, to further your career, who is your business lunch with? Mandela. He understood that groups have conflict. He understood that humans often do horrible things to each other. And yet his belief still was there's always the potential to bring people together. Despite whatever history there has been, there's always the potential to bring people together. You can always find something that will unite people who have not been united before. And I would just love to hear him and converse with him about what works, how to make it work, and then how to continue to do that work that all of us can do, not just the Mandelas of the world, but that all of us can do to bring each other together. Because it's the only way we will solve the global challenges we face. Ravi Rao, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks very much indeed to Ravi Rao. If you'd like to find out more about today's guest, you'll find links in the show notes, including to his terrific book, Emotional Business. That's also where you'll find the Y word contact details. So if you know of a great guest waiting to join us on the show, please put us in touch. From me, Ian Hawkins, have a great time. Till next time. <laughs>